Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Asia Mallory. I'm the consumer staff attorney at uh, the Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar about bail bonds versus home detention. Um, of course, you can follow us on social media. Here are our social media handles, as well as you can also volunteer for our one of our cases that you can find on our pro bono portal, um, as well as resources are also on our website. Uh, this is what our pro bono portal looks like when you go to our website. And here we will start our presentation, Bail Bonds versus Home Detention. Our speaker today is Matt Zernhelt. I'm very grateful that he has uh, decided to join us today. Um, he is the legal director and co-founder of the Baltimore Action Legal Team. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland School of Law and is the former executive director of Restorative, Restorative Response Baltimore, a restorative justice organization. He has also worked as a staff attorney at the Maryland Legal Aid with a focus on direct client representation. He has successfully practiced in both Maryland's Court of Appeals and Court of Special Appeals. So we are very happy that he is joining us today. And so I will turn the presentation over to Matt. Thank you, Asia. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And if anyone uh, wants to chat questions, I'll do my best to answer along the way. Uh, to talk about electronic monitoring and bail, uh, I'm going to try and do an intro about how the pretrial justice system currently works in, um, in Maryland. I also don't want to pose uh, pretrial justice as a dichotomy of uh, electronic monitoring or bail, as there are so many other options that uh, judicial officers can use um, in the way of community release, uh, supervised community release that are just not utilized right now. Um, but we will get to that. So upon an arrest in Baltimore City, I'm gonna focus on Baltimore City because that's where I focus. Uh, a lot of these rules, uh, you know, uh, operate throughout Maryland. Some jurisdictions do things a little bit differently, um, but these are the rules and they, uh, they, they are on the books uh, for Maryland, just depending on how the district's uh, resources operate. Um, you know, they may take different, take advantage of commissioners or folks might sit longer and wait for judges. But upon an arrest in Baltimore City, a uh, defendant is brought to the Central Booking and Intake Center, uh, CBIC, CBIF, uh, central booking goes by you know several different names, but once there, they are brought before a district court commissioner for an initial appearance. This is a pursuant to Maryland Rule uh, 4-213. Uh, you'll see that Maryland has rules that parallel each other. Uh, here is one example. Uh, this Maryland Rule uh, 4213 is also paralleled kind of by Maryland Code. Uh, courts and Judicial Proceedings, Section 2607, here's at Part C. Um, here in these rules, pretrial proceedings are allowed to be um, seen or reviewed by a judicial officer, which may be a judge, a district court judge, or a commissioner. A commissioner does not need to be um, certainly not a judge, doesn't need to be a lawyer, doesn't have to have a law degree, doesn't have to have a college degree, uh, can just be someone with a, um, a, a high school diploma. Uh, my experience, they do not always have the best understanding of the system um, and they just rubber stamp a lot. Um, I can get to that a little bit more, my experience in working with them. Uh, but uh, as soon as someone goes before a judicial officer, uh, this, according to the Supreme Court, uh, Roth Gree v. Gillespie County, uh, marks the beginning of an adversarial process and invokes the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. At an initial appearance before a district court commissioner, defendant is in custody, and unless the district court commissioner determines to release a defendant on their own personal recognizance or on bail, uh, defendant will remain incarcerated until a bail review hearing done before a judge. 
And that's again, Maryland rule of 4213, 4-213. If a defendant was arrested without a warrant, uh, which is maybe not the vast majority of the time, but you know, a, a strong majority of the time, the commissioner determines whether there was probable cause for each charge and for the arrest. And it's uh, Maryland rule 4-216. In the alternative, if there was no probable cause, the defendant is to be released without the setting of conditions. Um, I think this is worth note. Uh, the rules say a commissioner is to review the charges to see if there was probable cause. Uh, we've really dug through case search and scrubbed the cases of Maryland Judiciary case search to see what this has looked like. And we've got a long way to go, but in the data that we've pulled, we've seen you know, in 2019 cases, there were over 9,000 cases in district court that lived and died in district court in 2019. And it's, it's sometimes hard to see how they're coded, but maybe a handful uh, for what we can tell at this point where the judicial officer uh, determined that there was not probable cause. So the level of uh, review that is really given there um, you know, it's, it's questionable. Uh, it's really just, you know, passed on to a judge later. Um, officer's word, an officer's word is just taking, you know, facial value, uh, which I, I don't find just, you know, especially in Baltimore, you knowing the history of, you know, Baltimore police officers, um, particularly, you know, with the history of, you know, officers and, uh, you know, free acting officers, you know, units like the Gun Trace Task Force. Um, so people will be sitting, uh, you know, no matter what has happened on an officer's word, you know, from here, and it could be, you know, until the next day, or if this happens on a Friday, it could be until the next, <clears throat> the next court, uh, session of court on a Monday, where they would go before a district court judge. So if a uh, commissioner determines that there was probable cause, uh, pursuant to rule 4-216.1, um, they will be held um, or they can be released uh, pursuant to different factors that this rule lays out. Um, this 2 uh, or 4-216.1 does give commissioners a pretty uh, strict guidelines uh, for when someone should be released and what form of release they should be let out on. Um, it tells commissioners, you know, if this is the case, they should get released on their own recognizance or ROR. Um, and these circumstances, someone could get bail. Uh, in these circumstances, someone needs to be held. Um, for instance, if it's a you know, someone has a, a prior violent offense and, you know, this is a violent offense, you know, someone's going to be held. Uh, I think it's questionable uh, sometimes what's considered a violent offense because that's, that's a gray line rule in my opinion. Um, you know, is, is, you know, car theft violent? Um, you know, I, I think a lot can be argued there. Um, but, I've looked a lot uh, with partners at Open Justice Baltimore in, in screening how far the commissioners will veer from these guidelines and seeing that the commissioners do actually stick pretty close to the guidelines. There are not too many outliers uh, saying, you know, one consistently, you know, of the you know, roughly just over hundred commissioners uh, will, you know, you know, there's three of these hundred that will always hold second degree assault cases without bail. Um, it's really not the case. They all really stay in line and will treat the cases the same, except for that narrow window of where they can apply bail. Uh, that's where we see the most discretion used. Uh, some commissioners, you know, will use high um, amounts for bail and some will use low amounts for bail. Um, some commissioners Bail averages will average, you know, around five thousand dollars. Some bail commissioners' uh, bail averages will average around, you know, fifteen thousand um, dollars, and that's just the luck of the draw. What commissioner you get? 
Um, so once you, if you are held without bail, um, you will have the opportunity to request a bail review. You can go, you will go before a district court uh, judge the rule say immediately uh, if the court is in session or if the court is not in session at the next session of court. Uh, and that's Maryland Code Criminal Procedure Section 5-215. Um, there's, um, oh, again, I guess returning my experience with court commissioners, the court commissioners rotate. Um, court commissioners fill a number of roles. If you want to go file charges, you go against someone, you will meet with a court commissioner to file those charges. If you want to um, pay bail, uh, a court commissioner sits in the bail box in district in the in, in central booking. Uh, Balt has a community bail fund where we facilitate the payment of funds provided by the community to get folks out, uh, especially right now, so they're not sitting in, in COVID conditions in, in jail. Um, and you know, sometimes, you know, not every commissioner is, is the same, but sometimes they just do not care. And we will, you know, I will be, you know, we would be fighting with them to get people out um, because of the most technical you know, problems on their end uh, where they just, you know, won't let people out. And then when we do post bail, um, we get zero help sometimes. And we don't know when someone's getting out, you know, if it's gonna take six hours or, you know, 23 hours. Uh, to, to get somebody out, but it's it's an absolutely miserable process. Sometimes, you know, working um, down there with them. Um, let's see. Um, these commissioner hearings are held in a black box in the middle of the jail. They're not recorded. Um, we don't know who they are. Uh, we cannot get a list of their names uh, and their numbers. We can see on Maryland Judiciary Case Search for someone's case, who sets the bail in the way of a number. If you go down to the bottom of someone's individual case, you'll see uh, the docket entries and you'll see um, on the left, there's gonna be a three digit code. Um, whether it's got letters or numbers, can tell you if it's a judge that set, you know, what that docket, you know, holding or finding was, uh, or if it was a commissioner. Um, you know, I've tried to get, we've got an open case right now where we've sued the judiciary to tell us what those um, codes mean. You know, they, they, they tell us we can't have those numbers, but I think it's, it's our right to see who's determining people's liberty, but, uh, you know, we're still waiting uh, on that case. Um, so right now it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a black box. It's not open to the community. No one can see what these proceedings look like. Um, and we can't even find out who they are. So um, things that are to be considered, um, you know, are the type of charge, as I mentioned, um, someone's ties to the community, um, someone's employment, uh, things like that. There is a list I, I'll pull up in just a second. Um, if bail is allowed in that, that window of um, guidelines, uh, the lowest amount of bail someone can receive is $100 or 10% of $1,000. Um, the way bail works, uh, as a judge can set, you know, whatever number they feel, you know, appropriate. Um, and they can say, you have to pay 100% of this. You know, they can say $10,000 and you have to put up $10,000. But they can say $10,000 and you have to post 10% of it. Uh, so you have to show up with $1,000. Uh, and if uh, the defendant does not show up to court, and is not produced to court within 90 days, and you do not request a 90 day extension, um, that other 90%, the $9,000 that you did not pay uh, will be forfeited. Uh, so the, the court will keep your initial $1,000 and 
and a lien will be issued um, in a separate, it's really a consent judgment automatically issued. Um, you don't, do not have an opportunity to go. There's no real hearing. Um, again, I have uh, due process issues with this. Um, we have another open case on this matter, uh, but there's uh, just an automatic judgment entered against you um, where they keep your initial 10% or $1,000 in this case. And the court now has a lien against the um, person who posted bail and the defendant um, for that, that whole amount. I think that now shows the bail, and I can get to this you know, later if anyone wants to talk more about this, I think that you know, in itself makes bail illegal because it proves bail is only used punitively because at that point it's being surrendered as a punitive measure. Uh, once it's surrendered, there's no way to get it back. So them taking it does not assist in the purpose of bail, which is getting you to show up to court. So I, I think it's uh, moving into the Eighth Amendment, which uh, the Supreme Court says does not apply and should not apply uh, pretrial. Uh, so I think cash bail you know, has now crossed into a, a unconstitutional realm in the way that we use it. Um, but if we want to bring that up is, is another uh, community conversation. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're now having. Okay, um, so that's how bail can be set and how forfeiture works. Um, if someone is held without bail, they will be held obviously in, in jail um, and it could be, you know, and the next day for bail review of courts in session and it's weekday or for three days, you know, until the next uh, court review on a Monday. It's generally been held recently on TV screens because they're not transporting people um, to the courthouse uh, and they, they're not, they don't have the court, you know, in, in central booking anymore. Um, and that kind of, I mean, that denies uh, an attorney, defense attorney, the right to really confer with their client. Um, so everyone gets to be present except the defendant. Recently, it's been held over the phone during COVID, so a conference call. There's two things that have been, that are sometimes called bail reviews, the traditional bail review uh, in district court, and then the bail review review later on, which, um, is in circuit court. Uh, so first it's, you get denied bail and you are before a district court commissioner. If well, at that stage, uh, you have a chance to have the di district court commissioner's decision reviewed, uh, that can go well and it can go poorly. Uh, over 50% of the time, majority of the time, uh, the district court commissioner's opinion is uh, upheld, so it does not change, but the district court judge does have the ability to uh, increase it or decrease it, so it, it can uh, make your situation worse. Um, but if you are again held without bail, you can continue to request a bail review. At any court hearing, you can request a bail review again. Uh, you can also file a habeas corpus petition, which is really a suit against the warden of the jail, uh, saying that you're being held illegally. Um, so that's what I, I, I would call a bail review review. Uh, so any bail review that's being held in a, a circuit court um, would either be a review of a bail setting of a lower district court judge in a case that has since transferred up to circuit court, um, which would be, you know, select charges, uh, or if someone wanted a jury trial, um, and the case is you know, further down the line and they're still sitting in jail and they want to get out, or, um, you know, if they've taken the uh, route of filing a uh, motion for uh, habeas corpus. So that's where, you know, circuit court uh, bail reviews would be. You know, they're usually folks that have been sitting a little bit longer. Um, Recently on the telephone calls, judges have been stating it's illegal to record. Um, there's been a recent case saying that 
the um, the Institute of Constitutional Advocacy and Protection filed on behalf of a number of Baltimore community members uh, where the community claimed uh, the right to record um, and provide a video access to court proceedings. Uh, that right was denied. Um, again, now folks demand the right to be able to at least record telephone calls since that's the only access there is right now because that's the only way uh, uh, being able to listen to or hear or see uh, um, bail reviews you know, are, are, is available. Judges are now saying at the beginning of bail reviews that you cannot record these calls. I, I still think that that is a First Amendment violation um, as determined by prior Supreme Court case law. But at bail reviews, we got three parties. We got the state's attorney and their assistant state's attorneys. Uh, we got a pretrial uh, person from uh, pretrial services, which is a department under uh, Department of DPSES, Department of Correctional Services. Ah, what is it? Department of uh, Public Safety and Correctional Services, DPSES. Um, and then the defendants, a defendant and defense attorney, uh, the assistant state's attorney will make an argument to what they would like uh, over 70% of the time. Uh, and I think something like 73% of the time or 78% of the time, um, I have to double check. Um, in cases that uh, Baltimore Court Watch, uh, uh, community organization who has been watching or reviewing uh, pretrial cases um, since COVID started, they have seen the state's attorney has argued for folks to be held without bail. The court, after asking the state's attorney what they recommend, will ask pretrial services. Pretrial services really goes by a, um, a metric review um, or risk assessment tool and they will argue for or just suggest what they would like to see and then the defendant gets to state you know their case and why they would like to have you know, whatever form of release they would like to have um and then the judge makes their determination the defendant in maryland right now does not have the right or in baltimore does not have the right to cross-examine uh anyone does not have the right uh to really substantively challenge the, the probable cause in this case at this stage. Uh, it's largely accepted that the statement of probable cause, the word of the officer is correct and that's what's gonna hold somebody uh, you know, for months if they're gonna be held without, uh, without bail. Um, recently we, we had, in 2017, the court implemented a rule change um, saying that no one should be held on bail if that, um, if um, financial means alone was going to be you know, a factor to hold them, leaving someone's inability to pay the sole means, uh, reason that they're being held. So, judicial officers need to take into consideration someone's means to pay before setting bail. And this really did uh, plummet the use of bail. Um, the, the, the Court of Appeals provided guidance on how this um, new rule was to be used, promoting the release of defendants on their own recognizance uh, or when necessary, unsecured bond um, stating, in particular, commissioners and judges were to give priority to non-financial conditions of release and were prohibited from imposing an unaffordable condition or unaffordable financial condition or using money bail to ameliorate dangerousness. Uh, so someone can, a judge can't just post uh, $100,000 bail uh, to prevent your release. Uh, bail cannot be used just to prevent someone getting out, um, stratifying. Um, access to freedom. We did really see this change the system. We did not see it necessarily change the system for good. Uh, what this did was just 
take that middle section of folks that were getting out of bail, uh, the section of people that were in between folks getting out on their own recognizance and getting to go home uh, free until trial, um, you know, the folks that were getting out on bail and the folks that were getting out um, there um, or held without bail and that middle section was just kind of split and went either way. So it, it kind of inflated the held without bail section. Uh, some more people got out with their on their own recognizance, but a lot more people are now being held without bail. Um, and I can give you some numbers about what that looks like. Um, particularly, um, let's see where we're at. Along racial lines, I think an intention was to um, visit some racial discrimination that the, um, the courts were inflicting, furthering uh, economic violence uh, on uh, particularly black folks in Maryland and in Baltimore City. Um, in, Baltimore City District Court, uh, what we saw you know, as far as uh, you know, white folks held without bail, um, that went from 14% you know, pre-2017 uh, to 30%, so just over doubled. Um, and black folks went from 20% to 44%. Uh, so you know, more than doubled, uh, you know, stronger more than doubled. Um, but on the side of ROR, so folks getting out for, you know, on, on stronger, you know, on freedom, um, you know, we saw, um, A much smaller increase uh, while uh, you know, folks being held without bail doubled. Uh, the folks being held or being released ROR only went up 4%. Um, white folks who were getting out you know, more frequently ROR than black folks are still getting out more frequently than black folks. Uh, you know, it was 28% for white folks. Now it's 32% for white folks. For black folks, it was 23%. Uh, after the rule is 27%. Uh, the decrease in, in bail being set, uh, white folks were getting bail 41% uh, of the time. After the rule, uh, white folks were still getting bail 22% of the time. Uh, before the rule, uh, white folks were getting bail 48% of the time. After the rule, uh, black folks were getting bail 21% of the time. So now we see bails almost become something that's become a way out um, because it's, it's now the rules be, almost being used against folks is it's, it's just denying freedom um, where it was, it was absolutely violent uh, in, in forcing people to pay largely bail bondsmen. Um, now they're just not able to get out at all. Um, and there are electronic monitoring um, there is electronic monitoring, which its use has started to rise, uh, which I'll get up to in a second, um, but that is by no means uh, a strong option either. Um, the rules say if, you know, depending on what a judge determines at that bail hearing, uh, a judge is to, uh, if, the, if a judge is going to hold someone, uh, continue to hold someone without bail. The judge needs to put on the record the reason for continued detention. Uh, I'm continuing to push that it should be the reverse, that a judge should put in writing why no uh, form of community release would work um, and not just the negative. Um, I think it's a higher burden uh, that needs to consider all the other factors instead of just defaulting. Um, but again, the consideration of factors uh, are, are things like uh, defendant's family ties, defendant's prior record of appearance, 
um, nature and circumstances of the offense, a re request um, of any alleged victims, recommendations of pretrial release, recommendations of the ASA or assistant state's attorney, information presented by the defense attorney, uh, danger of a defendant to an alleged victim, uh, danger of a defendant to himself or herself, uh, it's what the rules say, um, any other factors bearing on risk of a willful failure to appear in the safety of each alleged victim. Uh, so 4216.1 subpart F, um, sub two, sub J, uh, kind of summarizes the Supreme Court's overall reasoning of why someone can be held without jail, the, the government's uh, purpose of pretrial detention, rationalizing uh, per, due, per due process, which is to ensure uh, someone shows up to court and uh, to keep the community safe. Um, again, uh, all, all arguments uh, aside. But the Maryland rules also provide a number of special conditions for release that I do not think the courts appropriately or uh, re regularly enough rely on. Um, and these are already provided that we do not have to argue for, we do not need more legislation for. Um, the courts already have a list of ways someone could be released instead of just holding them without bail. Um, giving them bail or letting them out ROR. And this is on Maryland Rule 4216.1, uh, subpart D. And it lists things like um, restrictions of travel, restrictions of association, place, and residence, requirement that a defendant maintain unemployment or seek employment, uh, requirement that a defendant maintain or commence an educational program, curfew. Um, uh, refrain from possessing a firearm or dangerous weapon, uh, refrain from excessive use of alcohol or drugs, um, undergo a medical or psychological treatment, uh, electronic monitoring, which I'll come right back to, periodic reporting to a designated supervisory person, which I think is something to really uh, highlight committing the defendant to the custody or supervision of a designated person or organization, which again, I think is something to highlight. Uh, execution of unsecured bonds, uh, which is something you are moving away from. Execution of a bond in an amount specified at 10%. Execution of a bond secured by the deposit of a collateral security. Uh, so putting up you know, your house or something like that. Or any other lawful condition. Um, I've seen judges make up uh, you know, really wild things. But I think there's a lot here that, that we can rely on that the court is not currently using. Um, the, the title of this you know, webinar certainly relies, you know, leans towards electronic monitoring. I don't think that um, electronic monitoring is the solution. I think it's something that we've looked to and argued for a lot during COVID just to get folks out from deadly conditions. Um, but I don't think state surveillance is where we should go, especially understanding uh, what we need to look to as a presumption of innocence, um, especially as we look to uh, the costs that are being imposed upon uh, folks for paying for their own electronic monitoring, how the system currently works. Um, how the system has been working under COVID is that, you know, if you are able to be released, a judge does agree to release you on electronic monitoring or an ankle bracelet. Uh, you have to go to a private company and uh, get a bracelet put on you and you have to pay that company. Um, and if you don't pay the company, the private company can report to the judge that, you know, you violated the terms and then the judge can send you right back. Uh, now you're marked that you have violated your pretrial conditions and you will likely have your pretrial release revoked. Uh, and what this looks like, um, you know, depending on how you've been or what your, um, who your attorney is, is how much you pay. If it's a private attorney, you're going to be paying $17 a day. 
If you have a public defender, they'll charge you $11 a day. So we're, we're talking over $300 a month, uh, which is just an outrageous amount of money. And with uh, trials getting pushed back months and months now, um, and people can easily pay you know, this for over a year um, just to have their cases you know, dismissed uh, or have you know, bogus charges filed in the first place. Um, we can't track the exact number of uh, cases that are being released on electronic monitoring or um, other forms or conditions of release because these conditions of release are put in differently on case search. Uh, they're considered released ROR with conditions. Um, sometimes it'll be typed in as ROR with conditions, or sometimes we'll just type in ROR. So unless we're in the courtroom for every single case, every single day, in every single courtroom, we just don't know. Uh, we know the cases that we facilitated payment for uh, uh, through community uh, donations. Um, in just 2020, uh, Baltimore Action Legal Team at Balt facilitated payment for um, 130 folks, or no, um, how many folks? Um, yeah, yeah, it was about 130 folks um, and payment ran about $160,000 uh, just to secure you know, freedom for folks from, from having to sit in, in COVID conditions in jail. Um, and this is, uh, I mean, just just a heavy, heavy, heavy load um, the community has assumed to keep people safe. Um, there has been new legislation passed that if someone is deemed um, impoverished, that the government will pay their electronic monitoring fees. Uh, it's still being worked out how that system is going to work. Um, currently, it looks like they're still going to be put on private home detention, uh, and private home detention is going to be paid that fee. Um, I still don't think that that's perfect, A, because I think uh, electronic surveillance is not the answer when there's more effective uh, and just forms of pretrial supervision. Um, and I think there's a huge population uh, that of folks that are that are still left out, um, and you know that this is still you know a violent, economically violent, uh, you know, form of of you know, pretrial supervision. Um, so we're still waiting you know, to see how this this rule is is going to be implemented. Um, but it's certainly not, not a stopping point. Um, so while we've seen bail be reduced um, and we're seeing electronic monitoring go up, the, the future is, is still an open question. Um, but returning to some of those other options that we saw, um, other states use things like uh, periodic reporting to designated supervisory persons in, in much greater rates. Um, like Jersey has, uh, you know, a, a, a tiered community re release system. Um, people can check in, you know, bi-weekly. Um, they can check in weekly. They can do telephone calls bi-weekly, uh, you know, FaceTime calls, things like that. Um, they can have an electronic monitor on their uh, ankle if absolutely necessary, but not be restricted to home. Uh, they can go and actually, you know, work more freely. Um, they can, folks can be assigned uh, over to the custody of a family member, you know, drug and alcohol treatment center. Um, there can be the formation of another agency under uh, health um, department, uh, who can take a holistic view instead of a correctional view, a community organization, um, any number of organizations. It's just not pretrial services. Um, 
who, who is taking a, um, a custodial view uh, with a correctional lens. Um, and I, I think, you know, if folks are successful in you know, checking in with the FaceTime uh, or being able to go to uh, the courthouse every other week uh, or however long is deemed necessary you know, outside of the work hours, you know, with the agency that's willing to work with them in a, in a fair way, uh, folks do not have to sit in jail. Um, because these, these, these methods have proved you know, reasonable in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, I think trouble arises with the use of risk assessment tools. Um, a lot of jurisdictions are relying on risk assessment tools, which is something that we're not for. Uh, a lot of our community uh, partners, a lot of Baltimore organization, community organizations are not for, um, as they really turn people into numbers, uh, they take into factors to determine whether someone is a risk, a flight risk or danger risk. Um, and these factors are impossible to remove race from, so they are wholly um, discriminatory. Um, and I don't think you can determine uh, the outcome of an individual. Uh, I think the, just on numbers, I think we need to look at people individually. Uh, and, and give folks a chance and, and see their humanness. <clears throat> um, I think we also have to look at uh, the fairness of our justice system. Um, that we're still overusing uh, um, the jail, holding the people without bail and, and, and electronic monitoring um, bail at an alarming rate. Um, we've found that folks that in that, I told you we've, we've reviewed uh, cases that lived and died in the district court in 2019. Um, this work was largely done uh, by my colleague, Megan Kenny, um, finding that over uh, 9,000 cases um, that lived and died in district court uh, of cases that were held without bail at least once, um, over 70%, 72% had all their charges dropped, um, which is just a mind boggling number of cases that involve people uh, losing their freedom, losing a fundamental liberty, um, and just having the case disappear for um, being fundamentally flawed uh, as, you know, for a number of reasons, but likely um, just because there's no, there's no actual case against them. Um, and the criminal justice system is just pulling people in um, where, where it shouldn't be. Um, with that, I'm going to pause and see um, if there's any, any questions in the chat, um, which I don't see any. Um, and I am sure I'm full of other things to ramble on about. Um, I think I'll toss one more thing out before uh, coming to a close. We were looking into some other charges um, or other claims right now uh, where we'd like to improve the way that the system's working um, to reduce the violence that's being imposed on the system uh, or on folks moving through the system right now. Um, we think that some fundamental uh, Supreme Court cases, um, due process cases, uh, have given right to have uh, the option for uh, live testimony at a bail review uh, to question a probable cause as soon as someone is pulled into a um, commissioner hearing, as soon as someone is being uh, detained, uh, the Fourth Amendment is applied. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Fourth Amendment governs pretrial detention, uh, so there should be a 
uh, there is a fundamental right to challenge that probable cause, and it's not afforded to a defendant until way too late in the system. Uh, so bail reviews should afford a substantial um, review of that right, which is not happening right now. Um, and the major uh, Supreme Court cases on pretrial detention uh, have really included that right in a way that Maryland and many of the states do not respect. Um, and that's something that we'd like to you know, advance and as well as um, you know, changing the burden and what is imposed in reviewing whether someone should not be held, but why can't they be released and, and you know, what, what due process does look like there. And you know, we, we'd welcome anyone uh, joining us in, in that argument. So please reach out uh, if that's something that you'd be interested in, in talking more about. So with that, I will call it, uh, I'll call it, call it quits. Um, but it was a pleasure getting to talk with everyone. Uh, and um, I wish everyone a good day. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, presentation. That was a lot of information. I, I do have a question. How, um, as an attorney that is, uh, or attorneys that are unfamiliar with this area of law, how would they begin to assist clients or folks that are going through this bail bronze or home detention or pretrial uh, situation? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think in a consumer rights lens, there's, there are some interesting arguments that there's been a recent case um, made it to the Supreme Court uh, from Colorado that basically said that if someone ultimately wins their case or is acquitted, really finds their, themselves in a place where double jeopardy no longer applies uh, and their presumption of innocence withstands, um, any fines and fees that they paid should be paid back to them. Um, so I think there is a, a, an argument to get any electronic monitoring fees back, any fees paid to the court back. Um, I'm not sure how far we can get that to go. Um, you know, if it can go towards bail bonds or anything like that on unsuccessfully defended cases. Um, bail bonds might be a little bit harder, but who knows. Um, I think, um, I mean, bail bonds cases are, are and I know the bail bonds industry is so strong uh, and they live forever. Um, but I, I, I do think that there's, um, there are arguments out there. I think that the court, especially this past year during COVID, um, the court has entered judgments, uh, not respecting uh, tolling provisions. Um, it's happened to us, uh, it's happened to me in fighting one case right now where the court entered, of course, I mean, in my opinion, um, super questionable where we had uh, someone not show up to the court date and a few days after the 90 days uh, where they could have uh, brought, or where, they, where this person's um, return to court would allow the return of the, the bail bond. Uh, they sent a warrant squad out for them. So it's, it almost seems like they waited for the 90 days to be up so they could keep the money and then, and then uh, sent a warrant squad out to get him. Had they done it a week prior, they would have had to give the money back. Um, but uh, either way, the, the Court of Special Appeal or the Court of Appeals said that this whole window was told because of COVID, so they shouldn't have entered that um, that forfeiture anyway. So I think that's one way to look into you know some bail forfeitures right now um, or other forfeitures really you know based on uh, statutory provisions. Um, everybody's circumstances are different. You know, certainly I'm sure you all know you know bankruptcy. Um, something to, to look at, um, you know, if it's right for somebody. Um, I think I'd have, definitely have to think a little bit deeper on that. Okay, I think, I think it was a good start. It was a good answer to my question. Um, 
because we just, I think as a consumer attorney, I do see a lot of uh, bail bonds cases coming to the affidavit judgment docket where a lot of the clients are just like, well, he wasn't convicted, but we're still paying this premium or they're paying above the premium, um, which does, uh, well, Matt, are you finished with your presentation? I didn't want to move on to yeah. Okay, so which does um, lead me to move on to like how bail bonds, home detention and race equity and uh, how that all relates. I'll just uh, share my screen again really quick. Um, So the ACLU, uh, they wrote a report in 2017 called Selling Off Our Freedom, in which it explains how uh, bail bonds and home detention are really just one of the um, biggest traps for our criminal justice system. I went through the report and I just pulled out a few information or tidbits about specifically Maryland. Um, in Maryland, of course, bail bonds and home detention definitely traps families and debt and losses, especially families who are low income or are uh, black brown. Um, in uh, 2017, they, uh, the OPD, the Office of Public Defenders, found that $75 million were kept in premiums from people um, who didn't receive conviction, whose charges were dropped within weeks. But um, because they couldn't afford the, and they couldn't afford to pay the bail, uh, they got they signed these bail contracts and went into installment plans, and so they've just been paying on this bail even though there's no conviction. Um, they also found that a lot of for bail for profit bail companies cost the Maryland families over two hundred and fifty million dollars, uh, not including interest and fees. Um, most of these, uh, most of this money is coming or is concentrated in Maryland's poorest communities, of course, and then of course, overwhelmingly, most of them are paid by black people. So that is just some information that you all should keep in mind when we are looking at bail bonds and home detention. Um, I do thank everyone for joining us for this webinar. Um, of course, uh, MVLS, you can join our panel. Um, you can uh, become a volunteer. You can help us take a case. I do want to thank again, Matt, for joining us for this presentation. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.